the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and the fall of Rome and the way forward for the people of Jesus. Our guest today, Professor Patrick Parkinson, who says we are facing a fall of Rome moment in Western society. Christendom is over and we need to not put our trust in princes in the way that American evangelicals have done so disastrously. Professor Parkinson is the Dean of Law at the University of Queensland. He was speaking at the lectures for the University of New South Wales' new college last week. We've linked to those lectures in the show notes of this program at thepastorsheart.net. But just before we come to Professor Parkinson, if you could help us get the word out about The Pastor's Heart, do link or like this episode on Facebook or YouTube, share it on social media, let a friend know about The Pastor's Heart. And look, we're looking for your financial support to help pay the small team who make this happen. You can go to patreon.com slash thepastorsheart and we would really appreciate that. Professor Parkinson, thank you for joining us. Uh, in your new college lectures, in really a climax of those lectures, you call this a fall of Rome moment. What did you mean by that? Well, when we talk about a fall of Rome moment, we're talking against the whole backdrop of history. Civilizations don't collapse in a moment. They collapse after a long erosion. Um, the walls crumble, the weight-bearing pillars become weak. In Australia, the white ants eat away at the frame, and eventually things start to collapse, but it is after a long period leading up to that. Well, could you take us through what's been the lead-up leading up to this fall of Rome moment then? What, what, what does it look like when you say the white ants have been eroding the pillars? Yeah. Well, one of the signs of that erosion, I think, is that both on the left and the right of politics, there is a lack of belief anymore in the fundamentals of, of the tradition of Western civilization we have inherited. If you take the United States, for example, the dominant narrative on the left of politics, particularly in the universities, is one of victimization and oppression. It's a pretty negative view of our, our, our society, one in which people are crushed, oppressed, victimized, and so on. On the right of politics, where you would expect a lot of, res of um, respect for tradition, you find that um, the Republican administration currently is trashing a lot of the values which we hold dear, the rule of law, truth, those sorts of things. So on the, both the left and right of politics, there's a lack of belief in the values which underpin our civilization. Now that's true in the United States. It's true on the left of politics across the Western world. But it's also true on the right of politics in places like Poland, Hungary, where there's now not the same commitment to fundamental values, free speech, the rule of law, and so on. And a society which does not actually believe in itself anymore cannot last for long. That's the fundamental problem. How do you see those symptoms on the left and the right playing out in, say, the United Kingdom or Australia? Well, what I see is a gradual erosion of fundamental freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of association, the right of groups to um, form together and to have rules about membership and exclusion from membership. These are all under threat in Western societies, Australia in particular, but in many other countries as well. And these are fundamental values, Dominic, which we've held dear for a very long time. People have died for them. There's not many people who will be prepared to die for those values now. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm hearing you and others say Christendom is over. How are you seeing uh, evangelical leaders refusing to accept that or accepting that and embracing that statement? Well, when I say that Christendom is over, what I mean is that Christian values no longer underpin the law, underpin the society in the way they once did. And there's not a shared consensus around Christian values anymore. You see this in the fact that we've lost every major cultural battle. We've lost the battle over no-fault divorce, over uh, same-sex marriage, over abortion, over euthanasia increasingly. Um, and we will continue to lose those battles as we become more and more of a minority in the society. Now, I think that some Christian leaders, at least, have found that loss of cultural impact quite hard to accept. And you see this particularly in the States where there's been this um, Faustian bargain with Donald Trump 
this concern for Supreme Court judges to be, um, be on side. And what's happening there, I think, is that evangelical leaders and some Catholic leaders are trusting in princes, presidents, judges, rather than trusting in the Lord our God. And that's a quote from one, Psalm 146. We have to trust in God, not in princes. It seems like a desire to cling to power, whatever the cost, whatever the collateral damage. Yeah, I think the damage to the evangelical movement from the evangelical alliance with Trump is extraordinary. The reputational damage is extraordinary. And I'm glad to say in Australia and other countries, we haven't made that mistake. But what we have done is to make the mistake, I think, of being quite aligned to the right of politics. We need to recognise that we will not find salvation. We will not find answers in any prince, be it a left of centre one or a right of centre one. And we've got to then find our new pathway um, in a post-Christian society, a post-truth society, without aligning ourselves with one side of politics in, in any way. So, I mean, I think you were saying to an evangelical leader like me, or other evangelical leaders, we shouldn't be um, telegraphing which side we're intending to vote for. Absolutely not. And I think we need to keep a dialogue open with both sides of politics. It's really important that we <clears throat> see that um, on the left of politics there is a long-standing concern for the poor, there's a long-standing concern for refugees, uh, and so on. I'm not saying the right of politics doesn't care about those, those, those things, but historically they've had different emphases. So it's important to look for the good in both sides of politics and keep the dialogue open. When you said a moment ago um, that we've lost every battle, um, how do you think we should engage in the public square, if at all, going forward? I think it's very important that we continue to engage and those people like myself who have a voice in the public square continue to exercise that, that voice. We've just got to be realistic about the extent to which we can influence the society anymore. But we've got to be concerned about freedom of speech, got to be concerned about freedom of religion, got to be concerned about the poor and the, the vulnerable and having our say as taxpayers and, and, and as voters in the public square. But what I say in the, the lectures to which he referred is that the time has come where we need to pivot in a different way. We need to look at what's happening, realise civil that Christians are over, and regroup as the churches. And what that means is that we need to refocus on being strong communities of faith, rebuilding our family life, re rebuilding our community life, so that we have a better story to tell to the community into mm. the future. You, you sound like you're talking there about the Benedict option. Let's just come to that in a moment. because. But just before we come to that, um, I mean, you talked about people you, like yourself in the lecturer in law p p position, although actually for our audience, we don't have too many lecturers in law listening to us, watching us, but we have quite a lot of senior pastors. What's your adv advice to the senior pastor about how we might engage the public square? I think it's really done through church leaders. Um, it's difficult to have a voice in the public square except through spokespeople. So archbishops and other leaders like that, they can get an audience with the prime minister, they can get a meeting with the attorney general and so on. And I'd encourage all church leaders to be engaged in that sort of, that sort of way. I chair a, a think tank called Freedom for Faith and we engage in the public square and work with church leaders on those issues. We provide a lot of the content, if, if you like, but they provide a lot of the support. On the Benedict option that you were alluding to before, could you just elaborate that and then, and then tell us how, where you like it, where you want to kind of depart from it? So it's a book written by Rod Dreher. He's an Eastern Orthodox um, man in the United States, and it's one of the most influential books of the decayed in Christian circles. Rod has a very similar view to me that Christendom's over, that we're going to go into some dark times. And he talks about building strong arcs for the journey across a long sea of night. And I think that's right. I think that's what we're going to be experiencing in Australia and other countries as well. And building strong arcs means taking time out to rebuild our foundations as a church to turn inwards in order to turn outwards. 
And by building our resilience, our depth of understanding of the Christian faith, our love for each other, we will better survive the difficulties in the world out, world outside. Mm. Uh, so you're not advocating going to the monastery. You're advocating something about rich community life as a Christian person gathered around the word of God deeply. Is that right? It is absolutely so. And the contrast is with what is happening in the world around us. There's been a serious decline in family stability. About 40% of all children in Australia will see their parents separate by the time they're 15 to 17 years old. About 13%, more than one, eight, one in eight, will be born into a household without a, without a father in the home. And although divorce rates are relatively stable, a lot of children are growing up in de facto relationships, cohabiting relationships, which have much higher rates of breakup. So all this means is that in the world around us, family life is becoming increasingly unstable. And that has impacts upon the mental health of children and young people, but it also creates a much greater sense of loneliness in the society. Do you know that of that in 2017 in Australia, we had the lowest marriage rate on record, roughly half the number per thousand population we had in 1970. So a lot of people out there in the community are struggling in their family life, struggling with mental health, struggling with loneliness. And the church can be like a city set on a hill. The church can be a refuge for those people. It can be a form of, of evangelism. But only if our foundations are strong, only if we have worked really hard, much harder, on building safe, stable and nurturing families. And from that strength, others can find help as well. Let, let's come back in a moment to the way forward and the, and the issues of loneliness and how to address those. But just to wind back to the problem, as you talked about the decline in Western civilization, I, I'm taking it, I mean, that marriage statistic that you just gave about the, I mean, that shows something profoundly unstable and increasingly unstable about the society we're living in. Absolutely. Families are the foundation of a community and a, a society. And those walls are crumbling as a society. And so that has all sorts of impacts across the population. But one of them is mental health, and it's a very, very serious one. There is a significant increase in psychological distress and in all sorts of mental illnesses in Western societies. Now, I'm not saying for one moment that that's just to do with family breakdown. There's lots of causes, um, including our internet age, but it's clearly one of the causes. And if you look at these, these, these statistics, you'll see that there are much greater mental health problems for children raised in step families, single parent families, and so on, than if their parents are living together, still intact, by the time they reach the age of 18. Mm. I remember somebody saying to me once, the most loving thing I can do for my children is stay married to their mother. That's absolutely right. And there's just not a belief in that in the wider community. So it's one of those um, things which has crumbled over time, our belief in marriage as the foundation of family life, our belief that that's important, important to stay together. So churches have a real work to do, to repair the foundations, as it were to build strong communities. Let's move to this, um, this issue of, a, of, of noticing loneliness, noticing singleness, um, not necessarily linking those things, um, but uh, let's come to this issue of noticing loneliness in the community and s churches speaking into that space. How can we do that better? Well, let me explain a bit more about what the loneliness issue is. In Australia, about 30% of all young adults today will never marry. Statistically, that is so. Some of them will have de facto relationships, cohabiting relationships, but they will probably not last in most cases. They tend to be quite um, <clears throat> easily dissolved. A tiny number will have same-sex same, same relationships. But a lot of people will just simply not find a, a life partner or if they do find somebody who they think will be a life partner, it doesn't work out. So we have people who are single by choice, 
We have people who are single because they haven't found a partner. And we have people who are single by shipwreck. That is, their marriages, their other relationships have broken down. And that has all sorts of impacts of, upon them. It has impacts on f fertility. People don't have the number of children that they wanted or any children at all. And it impacts on their finances going into old age. So what we're building, building here is a huge problem in the society. What would Jesus have us do? I think he would have us build strong communities in which people can find nurture, can find support if they haven't found it in their private lives. To quote Psalm 68 verse 5 in the NIV, God sets the lonely in families. Hmm. Um, I think you were saying to me before that as Christians, we've got a better story to commend to the world. What did you mean by that? I think that in the church, we've to some extent lost belief in the Christian teaching on sex and marriage and family life. I suspect this is something the pastors are a bit loath to, uh, to admit, but I wonder how many young people in our congregations really do believe that sex outside of marriage or sex before marriage is not a good, good thing. I think we do have a better story to, to tell on this. If you look at the research on it, um, and it's very interesting, I think you'll be able to show some, some, uh, some, some yeah. graphs on this. Now, we've got um, people listening to us on the podcast, but also quite a lot of people watching us. And if you are listening to us right now, you should go to, well, come across to our website at thepastorsheart.net and uh, we'll put up a graph on the screen here. And it's one on... Uh, relating to sexual satisfaction. And uh, maybe you could talk us through this graph comparing the non-Christian couple, the the mixed Christian or the mixed faith marriage, and then the where both partners are people of faith. Yeah, thank you. It's a study recently published of people in 11 countries, all of which had a Christian heritage. So probably when we talk about religious people in this study, we're talking predominantly about Christian people. 10,000 people were surveyed, and the researchers broke them up into three groups. On the left of the graph are those who have no faith at all. They rarely or never attend church or any other religious organisation. In the middle are those who occasionally go to church. 13% of them, one goes, the other one doesn't. But most of them, they just occasionally go to church or some other religious body. <coughs> On the right-hand side are those who are highly religious. They both go to church, they both pray. And what you see is that women's sexual satisfaction in that highly religious, religious group is 50% higher than the other groups. And that's astonishing. Mm. For the men, it's also much higher, not quite as dramatic as for the, for the women, but it is much higher too. And exactly the same pattern, just not as dramatic, if we look at the relationship quality, which well, but, is the next but, Just before we go to relationship, so just looking at this thing, you're making the claim that Christian women have better sex than non-Christian women. Married Christian women have better sex than non-Christian women. Is that that's what you're saying? That survey is showing that very, very clearly. And, of course, one of the things about having a good sex life, Dominic, is that you've got to have a partner. So for all those people for whom... You know, they're single by choice or they haven't found a partner or if there's been a shipwreck, they're not going to have good sex lives, whatever sex in the city may say. So if we can build safe, stable, nurturing families on the basis of faith, the likelihood of satisfaction is so much greater. Hmm. And then the, the second graph that you've got here is on relationship quality. And again, um, the, the highly religious couple scores much higher than the non-religious. Do you want to just talk us through that? Yeah, I mean, you, you see it again in the graphs, the, the highly religious are on the right-hand side of the graph, and it's not as dramatic as of sexual satisfaction, but the levels of satisfaction, both of men and women, with the quality of their relationship, is significantly, substantially higher than the other, other, the other groups. And that shouldn't surprise us, because... If you really do keep faith with Christian teaching, if your partner is the only sexual partner you have had, if there's an exclusivity about that, if you practice forgiveness 
in your relationship, if you practice communication, all the things which make relationships work, you will have a higher quality. You will have better sexual satisfaction. So there's a better story we have to tell, but we have to regain confidence in that message and communicate that to our flocks. I talk about it in the lecture as re-evangelizing the flock. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can do it by just prohibitions saying thou shalt not. I think we need to persuade people that the Christian view, the Christian teaching on sex and marriage is the better story, mm. is the path to happiness. I'm just thinking about that verse in uh, Genesis 2, um, that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And just the idea of being naked with your spouse and there being no guilt, no shame, no relational fracture, no sin, where everything that we, I mean, obviously we live this side of the fall now, but where we do have sin and there is fracture and there is disappointment and there is failure, but in a relationship where I can apologise for it and where I can seek forgiveness and be forgiven, then actually there's going to be a vulnerability and an openness and hence better sex than the one that doesn't have that. Yeah, and fundamentally too, we are driving in the same car. When we're both following the way of Christ, we have the same destination, we have the same core values, we have the same Lord who is leading us. So no wonder if we're really devo <coughs> devoted to God, no wonder our relationships with each other will be better too. Now, you're suggesting, I think, Patrick, that as we are engaged as pastors with the society, I'm just thinking of that Titus 2.10, we want to make the teaching of our Lord Jesus attractive. You want to speak about that for a moment? Yeah, I think it's very important that we get away from <clears throat> teaching about sex and family life in terms of thou shalt nots. We need to persuade ourselves and persuade others of the better story we have to tell. So that's not denigrating a single mum. It's not denigrating a same-sex couple. It's not denigrating anybody else's lifestyle. It's showing the positives that come from following Christ in this area. And that, I think, would be far more attractive mm -hmm. to young people. Mm -hmm. And you are engaging with them in the law faculty all the time. <laughs> I spend much of my life, of life with students. Yeah. Mm. Um, as you've um, articulated uh, this thesis and the surrounding ones about the, uh, um, uh, the pressure we're under as a church in the society at the moment in the lectures last week, where did you get most debate and engagement? Um, probably around family. Mm -hmm. um, the <clears throat> data I presented is very confronting, very confronting. The growth in mental illness, the difficulties uh, <clears throat> that people are experiencing, and also the fact that um, children are not nearly as safe in uh, relationships where they, they aren't living with two biological parents. To give you some data on that, one of the most famous studies of child sexual abuse, an area which I've worked in for 30 years, was a study in San Francisco. The researchers found that one in 40 women in that study had been sexually abused by their father. But amongst those who'd grown up with the stepfather or another male in the household, it was one in six. And that's been replicated in many other studies, rates of child homicide very much higher where there are step families. So it's really important that we see protecting that marital relationship as being about the safety of children as well as every, every, everything else. So that, that, that was very confronting for people. Yeah. yeah. Patrick, thank you very much for sharing with us this afternoon. Thank you, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Patrick Parkinson, and uh, Patrick, the uh, Dean of Law at the University of Queensland, and of course, uh, the presenter at the New College Lectures at the University of New South Wales uh, this last week. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. Thanks for your company, and we'll catch you next week.